Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, part three of this um, course is evolution and plate kinematics of the East African rift system. So we're talking about the, the broader area, in fact, all the way from area called AFAR up there down to the Southwest Indian Ridge. On these early maps, you will see the East African rift system is drawn down as far as Mozambique. There was no suspicion that it may extend past through Southern Africa and away down here, or through Madagascar. And so that's among the things that we'll be um, uh, looking at today. So that's the way I want to, just a, a quick introduction of, uh, again, of how many plates are there in Africa and, and since when. So the whole origin of the African plate breakup, I want to look at that. Also considering that Arabia, prior to about 25 million years ago, was part of Africa. And so in, in a sense, uh, there was a greater African plate before 25 million years ago. And then looking at the uh, review of the history of how uh, our concept of what's going on in the East African rift system, which is essentially the big Nubia Somalia plate boundary, um, how that's developed. And so I'm going to look at how we understand this, mainly from the earthquake story as well as from, as I explained yesterday, GPS. And then, uh, and so GPS technology, looking at that again and showing you some pictures about how we undertake these things um, is what I'll be doing. And then um, talking first about Mad Madagascar, actually, I thought I'd begin there and I'd, I'd go, um, in a sense, just to step back. I'd go clockwise around the system, go from Madagascar round up to the Victoria Plate and then down through towards Mozambique. So that's the way I propose to deal with the, uh, the East African story today. And then I'll talk again about what this has for uh, the implications that it has for the driving forces, what is actually driving all of this um, uh, at the end. So you don't have to read the details here. The, the important things are that uh, the initiation of the Red Sea is reasonably reliably dated at about 24 million years ago. So that's, and the Red Sea essentially is the northernmost part of the greater uh, East African rift system. Uh, that was developing uh, and then from the Gulf of Aden at around about 11 million years ago, we developed what is called now the AFAR triple junction. Previously, it was just Africa and Arabia uh, rifting apart, and then afterwards, Africa, Somalia, and Arabia, as one goes anti-clockwise around that, that AFAR region, which is the bend in the Red Sea. Just in terms of, of time frame, since um, I, I thought I would just again r remind you of the most recent period of geological history, the Neogene, the late tertiary, and, and the more recent divisions are what we call epochs of the Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, and then right at the top here, sort of magnified greatly, is the Holocene. Um, some of you may be aware that there's a proposal that uh, there's beyond the Holocene, the Anthropocene. Uh, which has started, and there's an argument about when exactly that, that might have started, but we won't go. That's just a tiny fraction of this time scale. So the key, sorry, uh, just let me go back there. The key magnetic anomalies, first of all, that we deal with, because initially plate tectonics was known primarily from the ocean ridges. It was really the mapping of the ocean ridges and the mapping of the magnetic anomaly patterns uh, about them that gave us the call it the kinematic information, the rates at which things are moving, also the directions at which things are moving. And so these black and white bars over here are periods of normal magnetization when the North Pole, as it is now, the North Geographic Pole, is the magnetic North Pole. The white bands represent period in which the magnetic poles have quite rapidly split so that the North Magnetic Pole then becomes the South Geographic Pole. And so we've gone through these periods of polarity flipping from normal to reverse, normal to reverse, 
uh, and these have now been divided up into what we call crons. So there's cron 1, cron 2, cron 3, and they've been dated uh, by various ways. And so there are certain key anomalies. There's cron 1, which is what's right on the mid-ocean ridge now, and you can map the mid-ocean ridge by that normal magnetic anomaly as well as by its topography and the, and the rift valley in it. And then the first prominent anomaly beyond cron 1 off the mid-ocean ridges is uh, cron 2, and in particular what they call cron 2A, which is that wide normal magnetization band. That's quite conspicuous, uh, conspicuous along most ocean ridges except along the Southwest Indian Ridge, because the Southwest Indian Ridge is the slowest spreading oceanic ridge. Uh, and, uh, and you c often can't distinguish clearly Cron 2A from Cron 1 uh, in many parts of the, the Southwest Indian Ridge. So very often it's easier to map uh, what here is called Cron 5A, which is a, a late Miocene anomaly. And that's about um, 10 and a bit million years old. That's, this is the dating over here, linear. And so that's the way the different stratigraphic ages and the magnetic anomalies are linked to the time scale. And somewhere down over here in Cron 6 and, uh, is the opening of the Red Sea. The Red Sea, can, you can map the magnetic anomalies in that. Not very well. Uh, and, uh, and get information, mainly in the Gulf of Aden, we know. Uh, particularly from one of these anomalies at about 17 million years. That's the age of the Gulf of Aden part. Um, so um, another, uh, just uh, by way of, of, of thinking about these things, one can also look at the paleoclimatic and, and the tectonic events that are related to paleoclimates. Uh, and it's, again, uh, probably quite uh, important to note that at about the opening of the Red Sea, uh, which is, is noted over here, there was a, 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 a kind of warming of the Earth's climate. It had been the late Oligocene warming. And then one began a very slow uh, cooling leading into the Pleistocene uh, up over here. So, uh, and we have these uh, paleoclimatic events, uh, some of which uh, certainly in the later part uh, seven million years and onwards become quite important for the paleoclimate of Africa and the evolution of humans in the East African rift system, but I'm not going to go into that now. So the person who prepared these maps, sorry, I'm going to go back there because they run through, is, is Larry, Larry Lorbe, he's a friend from uh, University of Texas Institute for Geophysics, that's UTIG over there. And Larry does these uh, global plate reconstructions. He's got a project called the Plates Project, uh, and he did this some years ago. And so uh, uh, just that's the Nubius Somalia separation at about 10 million years, you, that's begin but you can barely see it on the scale. So prior to that, there's Arabia just beginning to separate after after 20 million years from, and the opening of the Red Sea uh, going forward. Oh, sorry, the, it, it tends to jump uh, up to the present day. So he, here, as I pointed out, th this is the, the Mid-Ocean Ridge and the lines that occasionally parallel the Mid-Ocean Ridge, particularly in the North Atlantic, where they're very well known. All of those are the magnetic anomalies and then the big fracture zones or transform faults that can be mapped uh, about the, uh, the Mid-Ocean Ridge, indicating the points that f were formerly conjugate on the, the opposite margins. So that took about 120 odd million years to open that ocean. Uh, the, any ocean that may open up here has only just, is, is about to begin. In fact, only in Africa, just there's oceanic crust in the northernmost part of the AFAR triangle up there. And maybe on the last day when we talk about volcanism in the East African Rift. I'll show you some pictures of uh, AFAR and the Eta Ale volcano, which is actually erupting quite spectacularly now in the last year or so. Um, okay, this is Peter Bird, and this is his model of Nubia Somalia, and as up to about 2002, and this is his publication in 2003, it was just generally accepted there were two big African plates, Nubia and Somalia. Um, I came along and said, no, no, um, this is a more complicated problem, and there are at least five, maybe six uh, uh, separate African plates. And so now the story comes back to uh, 
beginning to describe this, not just um, qualitatively, as we have now, rigid blocks with uh, seismic belts between them, but what are the rates of motion and the directions of motion uh, on either side of uh, this whole system. So uh, that's what we get into, and this is where it becomes, sorry, going back the wrong way, that's where it becomes important again to just refresh your memory for one's got plate A, brown, plate B, green. Uh, these are in relative motion, and you can choose which is the one that you want to regard as fixed. This is a fairly arbitrary thing. Uh, the, uh, one ca plate A can move with respect to plate B or B with respect to plate A. Essentially they are, because they are on a spherical surface, any rigid body motion on a spherical surface is in fact a rotation uh, about a, a particular pole. We call that the Euler pole from Euler's fixed point theorem, a famous mathematician from whatever century. And, and so therefore you get spreading ridges, transform faults, and so on in this kind of pattern. On the other side of this, somewhere on the other side, the two plates would be converging in this simple two-plate system and uh, things would be moving together in subduction, as we call it. So um, it's essentially from the uh, directions of spreading and the ages measured on either side of the spreading ridge and from the directions of these transform faults that we get estimates of the Euler pole. Um, because the transform faults, as you can see, have to be lines of latitude about those poles. So if you have a whole number of measurements of transform fault directions, in the end you can, by vector statistics, calculate a, uh, a pole. And that's what we do with earthquake slip vectors. The earthquake slip vectors, where we don't have mid-ocean ridges, we've only got the, the faults and the earthquakes moving. Uh, we, uh, those slip vectors constitute line of latitude directions and you can use them to solve for the, uh, the pole of rotation. So um, that's what we do. So prior to uh, what we call the Nuval 1 model, and just to remind you, and, and I'll come back to that again, Nuval 1 was a quantitative global plate model but it failed to uh, to distinguish Nubia and Somalia, much to the frustration of the authors, uh, as I know. So we had up to about 15 different pre nuval one solutions, and they were very well, you don't need to know the numbers. Oh, so, so what, just let me, I'll point out one thing. Uh, we, we specify the Euler pole by a latitude, a longitude, and a rate of rotation. So you can see here these rates of rotation are pretty small, like point, 0 0.6 degrees per million years. Uh, so these are extremely, along the East African Rift system, extremely low rates of rotation. In other words, very small uh, relative extension rates uh, in that. So here you can see, this is putting them on a, on a Google Earth plot, all of those 15 things, and you can see they scatter all over the place. The early ones, like uh, Le Pichon, uh, whose uh, uh, anniversary of his first paper in plate tectonics is being celebrated in June uh, uh, this year. Uh, he had one in, in the East African Rift System. Uh, Jason Morgan uh, early on estimated there had to be somewhere off Africa or uh, between Africa and Madagascar somewhere down here. And that turns out to be pretty correct. Although he didn't have any quantity, this, this was just a guess, really. Um, and then there were others. Um, some right down off in Antarctica, some over near South America, and so on. And uh, uh, this is just the, uh, the difficult ones are those, because those uh, estimates up there, all of those outlined in red or, or marked in red, uh, mean that Africa is moving, or Nubia is moving away from Somalia up to the north of this area, but is converging on Somalia in the south of this area. And all of this ought to be some kind of mountain chain or subduction zone being formed, which it clearly is not. And therefore, these poles have to be wrong. They, they, uh, and, but because they weren't uh, based essentially on good quantitative mid-ocean ridge data, um, basically everyone knew they were wrong, but they were the best that uh, could be offered at the time. Uh, um, I got involved quite early. I, I happened to be in a sabbatical leave in, in North America. 
met up with Seth Stein in San Francisco, and because on my way he said, why don't you drop in in Chicago or Evanston and, and have a meeting with my student group. Uh, and so on my, this is in August 1986. Um, Ch um, Seth Stein put me in a room together with Chuck Demetz, Don Argus, and, and we tried to work on uh, the results of this paper by Gordon Shadovsky and, and integrate them with the Nouveau One model. Uh, we, we didn't succeed. And I won't go into the details here, but there in the, the, the Nouveau One publication in 1990, uh, great frustration expressed that they, they, they predict slow right lateral strike slip along the East African rift system, which is clearly wrong. Uh, and uh, we are trying to use, work on models that use the less precise slip vectors from the rifts. And they, we were still, they were still trying that in 1990 after about five years or so. Didn't work then. Uh, subsequently, there had been another up to number 27. This says so that was 1 to 15, 16 to 27. Uh, and now you can see things are becoming much more stable. Um, southern hemisphere latitude uh, and, and the rates of rotation becoming pretty much uh, the same, about 0.1 degree per million years and the, the, the various models. So this is the, the, the story here. Most of them are beginning to cluster in this area. That's that there. This is a kind of broad ellipse. There's one up here which I just point out, and I, I associate the name there because I'll come back to him uh, in a later slide. Uh, but the most recent one is showing up very poorly here. And, and the reason why it's showing up very poorly is because maybe should I try and shift the light off or is, no, I, it'll, yeah. I think it's just, um, um, is this most recent uh, in this list by Sarah Stamps. There's a more recent version by, uh, involving another person whom I'll show later on, um, Saria, but uh, we'll come to that. So that's number 27 is over there. So uh, south of Mozambique essentially is where the best, um, in this um, time frame, the, the, the estimate is. Uh, and that's the, the, this is Sarah Stamps over here. And, and how this model that came about, I'll just go back to the, the previous. The, the colors over here represent the different methods that we used. Uh, by geological, all of the yellows, we mean geological data from the, the mid-ocean ridges attached to the different parts of Africa. In other words, the Southwest Indian Ridge or the Red Sea, which is over off the edge there. Um, in the case of uh, these, these two early ones, for example, Desi Chu uh, was um, a student of Richard Gordon's who worked on the Red Sea um, kinematics. Uh, and, and so he integrated Nubia Somalia with his work there. Uh, Jim Lamo was a, a student of Richard Gordon's who worked down on the Southwest Indian Ridge magnetics. Uh, and that was his model of um, of, so the, all of these in, in, um, in yellow are the, again, Ben Horner Johnson was a, another student of Richard Gordon's who worked down uh, on the Southwest Indian Ridge. In about 2000, 2000, the, the space geodetic estimates started to come in. Uh, Shivani Sella, Corne Crema, uh, Rui Fernandez, and, and so on. Um, and then, um, a little bit later, uh, when Eric Calais became involved, uh, Eric and I began to integrate both the space geodetic data and the earthquake slip vectors. So that's going back to the, uh, the attempt that had been done by um, Chuck Demetz back in the late 80s. Uh, and, and that got, of course, picked up by um, uh, Jean Noquet and, uh, um, and Sarah Stamps. So that, that's the story. So, so how we do this? Just to explain, there, there are two basic ways one can and, and, and types of instrumentation that one needs for this. In the one case, um, you, you adopt what is called a campaign strategy. And that, that, this is the instrumentation over here. Uh, and the monument is some solid piece of the bedrock that you can relocate your instrument on to the nearest millimeter, and I'll show you how that's done a bit later on. So you have a network of geodetic benchmarks. Oh. Um, sorry, going back here. 
My finger work here is um, a network of geodetic benchmarks, and that, there's a benchmark under that instrument over there. They're perfectly attached to the bedrock. Uh, you, can, you have to have that instrument there for at least about 48 or 72 hours because you, got, you have to get a, a daily point position, uh, and something at 48 is minimum, ideally more. Uh, the advantages are that you can move to a large number of sites with very few instruments. Uh, and you can then cover a big area at relatively low cost. Uh, uh, the problems are, one, that you don't know what transient deformations are going on between the times that you actually occupy that site. And you, you have problems of the monumentation and setting up the antenna accurately. The other kind of thing that we do uh, is have these things on permanently established monuments uh, which have power, uh, electric power supply, they have communications, telephone lines, or uh, and um, you can achieve, uh, and they record 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, every second. Um, and so uh, the sites have to be protected. They're generally not attended, therefore uh, there's a, a vandalism issue. Um, Data is downloaded daily and, and more frequently if needed. And so therefore the communications, sometimes satellite communications have to be online at those things. Uh, and you, you have better long-term precision and better detection. Problem is the cost and number of sites and the power and communications to those sites are the issues. So here's an example of um, a campaign, and that's why I'm beginning with Madagascar. Um, in 2012. Um, we began in Antananarivo. This building over here is um, a fairly venerable institution. It um, was founded by the Jesuits, I think, um, quite early on in the last century. And it's called the, Insti uh, the Institute of Geophysics in Antananarivo. And, and they had a, they've got at the top of this building a little telescope, and the first, one of the first African seismographs was established here by the Jesuit priests uh, uh, in Antananarivo. So uh, this um, is now the, the headquarters of Madagascan geophysics. Uh, it's headed by Gerard Rumbelmanan. Um, and we began there. This is uh, our team being trained in the use of the uh, the equipment, which is on loan from a U.S. universities consortium. All of this equipment, about uh, a, a half a dozen or more, I think we had eight instruments, um, and they come in these little pre-packed boxes. They've got the antenna, they've got the mounts for the antenna, and so on, and uh, batteries and, and communications stuff uh, in there. Um, but they are, are pretty compact. It's a kind of suitcase type thing that you can pack in the Land Rover and carry on. So this is us at one at our further site. What, what happened was Sarah Stamps went north with her team and I went south with my team. My team included my son there. Um, and this is us packing up at the station at some early hour of uh, quite early on in the morning on our final day. Strategy was to come down from Antana River, base ourselves, at this place, which is in a, a forest reserve, overnight, and then the next day move up very early, move to establish the site at Ansanavolo, another one at Ihosi, and then we camped over there, or had a, a hotel in the, in the village, and then established the third site, and then spent three days on the coast near Toliara. Uh, before we then quickly zapped through and in one day picked up all of those again. So that's the way it's done. This is a, a, a space of within about a week we had done that and gone back to Antana River. After that, I went west to another site. Sarah went east to the coast. Uh, and all of this was sponsored by National Geographic at that stage uh, because she got a grant from them. Uh, so this is us setting up an, at, at Ancelavolo. That's the site on this bedrock outcrop. Um, my, Michael and uh, Sabir Jolson, who was a PhD student. This is our driver. And there's the guard. When you set up these things, uh, you pay a local villager or somebody who lives close by to guard it while it's sitting there for three days. 
Uh, he gets paid only at the end when you collect it again, you see. So, uh, um, so that's, that, that was our guard for the site. There's the vehicle, short, short wheelbase Land Rover we traveled around in. That's the, that's the benchmark. It's a, it's a steel pin with a cross marked on the top, uh, which is drilled. You drill the, the hole and you epoxy that into the bedrock, and that remains as the marker for visiting. So Sarah had done this one in 2010. We came back in 2012. She came back again in 2014. So every two years, these were measured. Uh, and that is an ongoing thing uh, in Madagascar. We hope at some stage some of these will become permanent sites, probably these down over here in, the, in this area, uh, because they are on the Somalia plate. Quite definitely. This is a bit of a, a wide and, and uh, awkward boundary over here. So that, that's, what it, that's what you do. Then, of course, you have to orient the instrument. You've got this bracket over here which you have to level, and the pin goes on, and the, the point of the pin has to go into the, uh, the cross center. And then you, you measure. This is what Michael is doing here. He's measuring from the, the point to the top of the... Uh, uh, the pin at which the antenna is then going to be screwed on. And so we then know the distance between the, what is called the phase center of the antenna and the, and the benchmark. That's known to the nearest millimeter. Uh, and, and this is the end result. There's the, uh, the instrument, um, and, uh, and the, uh, this gets, uh, the box is contained over here. The other thing I didn't mention was all of this remains powered by um, uh, a, a portable, flexible solar panel. You just fold this thing out, and this is solar PV, which then drives any of the, uh, the computer, basically, inside the box there while that's recording. So that's how it's done in, in, the, um, in, the, in the campaign mode. Um, in the, in the, uh, with TrigNet, which I spoke about yesterday, this is the South African TrigNet system, which... Uh, my colleague Richard Wanacott, when he was with uh, Trig Survey in Mowbray, around the corner here, he established this. Uh, and so he and I still work together on interpreting data geophysically because he's a geodesist. Um, and then there is something called the International Global Navigational Satellite System Service, IGS. And they run stations around the whole globe. Uh, more than a hundred of them, and these are the important African ones, including some elements of the the Trignet system, like uh, Sutherland, Hardebeershoek, and and Richards Bay. Um, and so, what what these are? You you've got a network of permanently, permanent, continuously operating um, stations. In South Africa, they're at about 200, 300 kilometer spacing. They are the basis of the whole South African geodetic and surveying system now. Surveyors don't use or cite to trig beacons anymore. It's to GPS um, uh, stations. Um, and again, they're recording w at what we call one second epoch. Every second, uh, th and they, they receive data on frequencies. And where is your, your cell phone GPS um, or my wristwatch GPS? when I'm running, uh, is receiving what is called broadcast ephemeris from the GPS satellites. Um, geodetically, we don't use that. What, what these instruments do, the, uh, the type that you saw, those antenna and their computers, they lock onto a satellite once one appears above the horizon, and then they record the, the, the phase data. So they are actually recording wavelength numbers, and they are counting wavelengths all the time in two frequencies, as long as the satellite is visible. And it's directly from that wavelength data, once you come back with all of the data of three days of recording, or each day when they download at, uh, around the corner at Mowbray here, um, they post-process that data. And what they are doing is that they are solving for the position of the instrument and the position of the satellites at the same time. And then they refine the orbits, uh, satellite orbits from that data using uh, IGS data because IGS is doing this for the whole satellite system all the time too. Um, and so that's how it's done. It's not, you don't receive information as ordinary people do on your, your GPS receivers in your phone or your watch 
uh, it's all post-processed and computed in a very sophisticated manner. So whereas the accuracy of this is a few meters, the accuracy of these measurements is a few millimeters. Um, and, uh, and so that's what's done. Uh, in the case of the Trignet system, generally uh, you can get that data because it's all telecommunicated within 30 minutes after each hour every day. And the Nevada Geodetic Lab in, in Reno, Nevada, is actually getting uh, data from Mowbray every day um, and processing that data themselves to get precise point positions. So we sometimes use uh, Nevada Geodetic Lab data to do some of our work, like what I showed the other day. So, um, so that's how that's done, and this is what the data look like. And you can see these are uh, 50 millimeters, and, and all of this is done with regard to a right-handed system where the x-axis, uh, at the center of the Earth, x-axis comes out on the Greenwich Meridian equator, y-axis is, the north po uh, uh, is the, on the equator um, at 90 east, and then the z-axis is the North Pole. Uh, but you can also represent that as a, an east-north-up uh, uh, setup uh, uh, on the surface of the Earth. And so very often we, we represent this, we transform that XYZ data into what is called north-east-up uh, data at some arbitrary point near the sites that you're interested in. Uh, and, and then you can plot that as east component, north comp uh, east, sorry, north component, east component, and up component. In this case, for Harder Beersook, this is uh, Eric Calais some years ago we were processing this. Uh, you can see that there's about a, a 10 millimeter fuzz on the data, but overall you're getting pretty good linear statistics on that with a bit of uh, um, annual transients uh, that show up. Uh, you get more fuzz on the, on the up because um, the instrument does only see satellites over 180 degrees in the up direction. It doesn't see through the Earth, whereas in east or north direction, it's seeing around the full 360 degrees. So that's why up data is, is much less accurate than, uh, than others. So even with the... And you sometimes have bad days and bad data, uh, and that can be for atmospheric or other reasons as well. So um, uh, whereas with the, in the campaign, we, you are only coming along every year or two years just getting points along that line. So um, it's, it's much less precise than the, uh, the continuous data. So that's how we do it. Um, this is another one, Richards Bay. And uh, if you look, for example, in the, in the east component for Richards Bay, you can notice that there's about a millimeter per year difference from Hardebiusuk, which leads one to suspect that Southern Africa may be stretching a bit um, in an easterly or southeasterly direction in that area. So this is, again, I'm not going to go into that, but some years ago we already knew that, uh, that Mafeking, for example, was a problem station. And, then, and, and when you have data of too short period, you can have wide inaccuracies. So those are the white arrows. In general, you can see over here that uh, we get pretty good stable solutions in this part of, of South Africa, even though this is straddles a seismic, uh, somewhat seismic belt. Um, uh, and so that, that's shown. The other way you can, you can interpret this data is to, uh, to represent each of these as, well, as a so-called Delaunay triangle. Uh, and the, the symbol at the center over here is actually um, the strain tensor. It represents a, a pulling apart or pushing together. At, at that size, it's 10 parts per billion or 10 nanostrains per year. And I, I remind you again, uh, one nano strain is one millimeter in a thousand kilometers. So um, we have uh, very low, less than 0.1 nano strain per year in this part. Uh, uh, there are other parts in the Western Cape here where uh, there's a, a, a pushing together and a pulling apart in different directions, so it's a bit ambiguous around here. Also up over here along the eastern side, there's some relative to the overall 
stable Southern Africa, um, that's what we are seeing. And so we, we, we're still working on, particularly around here, hoping to detect parts of the Lewandli Nubia motion here. But it's, by and large, what this is telling us is that this part of Southern Africa is actually a, an extremely stable area. It's not being loaded pretty much, except maybe at, it, at, at its edges. And there may be things going on over here, but uh, we need more time to analyze that. So um, just to then come back to Sarah Stamps, this is uh, Ilifura Saria. He's uh, now a geomatics lecturer in, in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. But he was a PhD student of Eric Calais. Uh, and this is a, a very recent thing. It, this paper, I got informed by Sarah only yesterday that it appeared in Nature this week, on Monday, in fact. Um, and so this is the latest paper. I thought I'd, I'd uh, um, show this. So this is the area that's being covered over here between AFAR and the north and the southwest Indian Ridge. Um, this doesn't show up too clearly. I wonder, uh, shall I experiment with the lights here but after two days? I don't know which are those. Are. I was thinking of trying to turn those ones off over there, but... Uh, uh, one theater lights. Does, does that help a bit? Okay. Sorry, I should have done that um, earlier. Um, but here you have a picture of um, one the, the the rates of motion r uh, uh, around the East African Rift with respect to different reference frames. So uh, these arrows over here show Somalia moving relative to Nubia, uh, the red arrows. Uh, and, the, and the scale there is three millimeters a year. So you can see that's about between five and six up there. This is the, the reverse. This is Somalia, uh, uh, Nubia removing with respect to Somalia. So this is, uh, which, which reference frame you choose, as I pointed out, is arbitrary. The green arrows, which are the Vic Nubia with respect to Victoria, you can't see too well there down there. And then there's some blue arrows, which are Nubia with respect to Ravuma over here. Uh, that's mostly all you can see. Most of these red arrows over here are the motion of Somalia relative to Nubia in the south. But there, are this, there is this intervening plate. So um, these, these black circles over here are the earthquake epicenters. And this area shows the, the uh, this uh, diagram over here shows you the whole of the East African rift system as currently defined in this paper. Uh, as the black uh, with the what are sometimes called microplates, but they're quite large blocks. Victoria, Ravuma, Lewandli in that pattern. Uh, what you notice over here, these are this is the stable Nubia block, and you, you will notice over here that this is stable South Africa, as I pointed out from the, the GPS data. But you'll notice that these are the ISC epicenters for everything above magnitude two in South Africa, and you can see there's a pretty large amount of earthquake activity over here. A lot of this is induced by mining activity. Um, some of it is linked to large reservoirs such as um, uh, Katsi, um, Kohorabasa, Kariba. Uh, I think that's Kariba up there, Kohorabasa up there. Uh, but a lot is interplate activity in South Africa of rather unknown, somewhat mysterious character. And we may talk about that tomorrow when I talk about the induced activity and, and natural and induced earthquakes in this part of the world. So that's the, um, the thing I just thought I'd um, show that. Um, somewhere now I've got to make sure I'm pushing the right button. OK, I, actually, I should have pulled this up. The, these are the, the, the kind of vectors of motion uh, shown. And the other thing to note over here, these are, are earthquakes, uh, whether they are deeper ones, greater than 17 kilometers or less, of different magnitude. Greens, magnitude 4 and above, magnitude 5 and above, red, yellow, magnitude 6, and magnitude 7. Uh, and I'll, I'll just point out the big magnitude 7s in this catalog. Uh, Juba earthquakes. Uh, in 1990 in southern Sudan. Uh, and then the other big one, more recent one, is Mozambique, Machadzi, 
in Mozambique, magnitude 7 in 2006. Um, I think those are the only two, uh, because I'll be coming back to them, that I want to uh, uh, point out now. Okay, so here again, this is the data that one uses for this kind of, what is called, that's, this is an acronym for Sub-Saharan Africa Global Strain Rate Model Version 1. So that's what the, the acronym, and it's, it's strain rate modeling. Those strain rates that I showed you for the, the Delaunay triangles uh, are done in a rather more sophisticated version on a very dense mesh uh, in, in this model. And this is the G, uh, GNS data that's used. Um, and here you can see our, our southern Madagascar data, uh, of, of which I am a part contributor, it, it appears uh, in the set as well. Um, and the results, I, I don't want to uh, elaborate this, um, but essentially the old version, uh, this is Corne Crema's data, uh, and uh, remember I, I pointed out his polar rotation was rather uh, north, shows very low rates of strain throughout, uh, and also shows some, uh, you'll see later on, compressional strain down here in Mozambique, because he had a, a polar rotation which was quite far north and would imply Somalia was moving towards Nubia in this area. Uh, the newer data over here, um, uh, you will see in the next hour, the, the red uh, is the more, um, the higher strain rates, the, uh, the blue is lower strain rates, so you can see higher strain rates up in the north in Ethiopia, also some locally high strain rates down here in the, uh, the Rukwa, uh, Rungwi uh, area uh, between Tanzania and Malawi. Uh, and, and various strain rates. Here's the Rukwa Rift, you can see Tanganyika Rift, and, and Lake Malawi down over here. And, and down in southern Madagascar, you can see some, uh, uh, in the middle of the strain range over here, some white spots that show. Uh, what the next diagram shows is how you interpret this in terms of either contraction, of which there's almost none here, there, the, the strain rate model shows some, some areas of contraction locally, very tiny ones, some near contraction in parts of Madagascar, and some locally over here. This is that southern Madagascar profile looks to be a bit complicated. But the old model showed contraction down over here and very low rates of uh, extension or dilatation. So this goes from contraction in blues to uh, uh, extension in browns and kind of purples and whites. So the greatest rates of extension are up in Ethiopia. Uh, quite low rates of extension here getting higher over in this direction. Here you have low rates getting higher in that direction and we'll see the reason for that. And then along Malawi sort of high rates all the way down here getting lower and lower as you come south. So that, that's the way things work with the, and the, uh, the, the way the numbers work. Coming back to Madagascar and southern Madagascar, this is um, uh, again the comparison of the old versus the new on a, on a different kind of style. This is contraction versus extension and strike slip. Um, I don't want to go into the details, but it just shows that Madagascar is quite a complicated area and we, we still have a lot of work uh, to do there. Um, it's a fascinating country. Um, so, and, and the other... Um, controversy, which I'll come back to um, a little bit tomorrow, or certainly the, the end. Uh, this area up here, for example, in Madagascar, is a volcanic area. And there's a volcanic hazard there, and there's a, essentially young rifts developing here. So the whole issue of this being strike slip or contraction uh, actually is quite controversial still. I, I'm not convinced that either of these models is actually got on top of the, uh, the full story. So then just uh, moving away from Madagascar, coming around the circle, just focus, first of all, this is the, uh, uh, the, the this Mustafa Magrai's seismic tectonic map. Uh, here you see the rift, Ethiopian rift, uh, the Kenya rift, and the green triangles are the volcanoes. So you can see essentially one has lots of volcanoes up here in Afar. Uh, there's some that are largely obscured by the earthquake symbols and, and beach balls over here. Uh, the um, Kenya Rift is largely volcanic with low rates of seismicity. The Western Rift has got some volcanoes, the green triangles, uh, but is much more seismic uh, 
uh, rift system, lots of earthquakes with focal mechanisms. Those white upper, uh, the, the white quadrant beach balls show that this is, is rifting, it's extension um, throughout. So uh, looking at this area quickly before we come down to this part uh, is what I want to uh, go through quickly. So initially, I, I think I did mention, I, I was proposing at one point that this should be called the UN plate, um, uh, and the UN there being an acronym for Ukarewe Nyanza, which is the um, uh, local name, Ugandan name for Lake Victoria. Um, but uh, the, uh, Victor Kazman had previously proposed a, a Victoria plate in this area, so Victoria plate, it, it now remains. Uh, again, what this shows are the, uh, the Holocene volcanoes, and you can see uh, these, why, what I, why I say the Kenya rift is very much a volcanic rift with low rates of seismicity. Uh, the Western rift is very much uh, large. There are some volcanoes over here and some very big ones near Ogongo, Nyamagera, uh, up in this region. Uh, but largely earthquakes are what distinguish the, the Western rift. And here you have the, the earthquake slip vectors. And it's these slip vectors that are used to solve for the polar rotation between what Peter Bird then called Africa and what I called uh, UN, Ukareo and Nyanza. Uh, and so that's, that, that's the polar rotation. Uh, at this time, we were still doubtful about Ravuma and, and another possible plate called Pangani, but uh, I won't go into those now. Uh, what you see over here, and in fact in, in both this and the previous diagrams, is the use of new digital topography. Uh, so we have satellite, we are in our, this was 90 meter resolution, so-called SRTM, Shuttle Radar Topography Mission Data. Uh, we now have much higher resolution uh, satellite data getting down to 30 meters, 10 or even 5 meters. Uh, and so we begin to pick up very fine and subtle features of tectonic topography uh, in the terrain, and I'll come to this, particularly in Mozambique um, uh, later on. So here you have the Victoria Plate, its extent, the red are the volcanoes with slightly smaller symbols, and the blue uh, things are the Peter Bird uh, Nubia Somalia boundary. Uh, which, uh, and I'll, I'll zoom in on this part. Here's the uh, Victoria Nubia polar rotation. Uh, it's, Victoria is moving anti clockwise relative to Nubia. That's the, uh, the sense of the arrow over here. Um, uh, Victoria is also moving anti clockwise about this pole relative to Somalia. So, what this is telling you is that that pole over there is very close to the northern boundary. Uh, and therefore, Victoria is more or less attached to Africa at this point, whereas in this region down over here, Victoria is effectively attached to Somalia. And so you have a kind of um, crank arm motion that these blocks, both, in fact, Ravuma also in an, in an opposite sense. Ravuma is being rotated counterclockwise, but it's as if they are being dragged out and ro opening up like saloon doors. Uh, around this western part of the rift. So it's, uh, it's, it's a rotation which is driven by edge forces uh, in that sense, and that's the way we conceive this. Um, so here's, here again is the, the northern area, and this is the more detailed topography. And you can see one can pick up in this digital topography things like the Aswa shear zone, which was regarded as being the boundary of Victoria and, and Nubia until quite recently, except we began to realize the big earthquakes, the Juba earthquakes in 1990, the magnitude 7, uh, occurred in this area. This is this cluster of black dots, it and its aftershocks. Uh, Peter Bird boundary linked that along there. Uh, you can see in, in another model that I have, I link it in a more accurate way to something called the, the OMO triple junction in the area north of, of Lake Takana. This is what we call a ridge fault fault triple junction. This is spreading ridge, transform fault, transform fault. 
uh, this goes to another spreading segment of the Ethiopian rift. So th these are the kinds of uh, things we've been playing around with. Now, just again, to quickly mention the, um, the biggest, most recent earthquake in this area was on none of these boundaries. It was actually just west of, um, in uh, 2016, September 2016, it was west of Lake Victoria. Uh, it was a pretty large event, nearly magnitude six. Uh, it caused some injuries. I don't think there were any deaths, uh, although, um, uh, in Bukoba, um, schools were collapsed and there was some uh, uh, serious concern about uh, that kind of damage. Uh, here you have the, uh, the earthquake context from the International Seismological Center, I put that there, with the USGS epicenter map. And uh, it's again, it's from Max Weiss, it sees damage forecast for that area, it's just showing some of the, the character. It's in a swampy area just off to the, uh, on the uh, Uganda-Tanzania border, uh, just off to the west of, uh, of Lake Victoria, that's up there. So finally, just coming into this area over here now, uh, the, uh, what we regard from about Lake Malawi southwards to Mozambique. This is the boundary of the Ravuma plate with the Nubia plate. Uh, and, uh, the, the main features are that the velocities um, are about four millimeters a year up in the north over here, and then they fall to less than one millimeter a year down in the south over here. The pole of rotation of uh, Ravuma Nubia is that one over there. So that's the a very near pole to the southern part of the Ravuma plate. And, and the, the, the motion is clockwise relative to Nubia whereas the motion of Victoria is anti-clockwise relative to Nubia. Um, and so the, these are the, the forecast rates in that model. You'll notice over here in this model, uh, the, this is a rather generalized uh, view of what the um, uh, Luandli Somalia boundary is. Um, okay, the, the two interesting features I want to point out, or the one is that uh, the Zambezi River crosses this plate boundary. And it crosses it uh, near, near the um, a town called Kaya. Um, there, there's a system of forts running uh, along the Shira River, or just to the east of it, and down here into, uh, towards the Pungui Graben, uh, and this is a, there's a, a Zangui River coming into the Zambezi on that side. Uh, the interesting feature over here is when one looks at the, um, the character and the topography, uh, one of the things one can see is that there's a, a delta-like feature over here. And it's pretty obvious, I think, from the morphology of this area that when there is a, a very big earthquake along this fault, uh, the Zambezi gets dammed. So, for example, the typical offset on a magnitude 7 normal fault earthquake would, would be about four to five meters of topography suddenly developed across the, uh, the course of the Zambezi. So you would have, within a few seconds or minutes, a barrage put up. Uh, and quite clearly what would happen then is that the Zambezi would flood uh, the, lower, uh, the southern part of the Shira and the northern part of the Zangui uh, river complexes. And that's how delta-like features like this form, all of a sudden the, Zam the, the sediment being carried down by the Zambezi gets to be deposited um, there instead of out in the ocean. Uh, and so uh, uh, that is this kind of concept of earthquake flooding over here. I won't go into the details of how we determine the motions over here and what has been offset. There's a pre-existing fort which one can map project towards that fault and then calculate uh, how much total motion and what, given the, the, the model rate, what the actual displacement over s about seven and a half million years must have been since uh, uh, the formation of that feature. So that's wh what we've been looking at there and that's that area on this map. The other area I'd quickly like to look at before uh, closing up is 
This, this is a map I produced in 2002, and the, the background story to this is that um, engineering geologist friend of mine, uh, Wallace Evans, had been working on a pipeline project here. It's the gas pipeline from Tamani to Sasso. Um, uh, and he had encountered some strange things in the, uh, in the trench, and he wanted me to look at them. And I did, and, and this is why this was in 2003. So I produced this map for them because I said, you do realize, Wallace, that you're constructing this pipeline over active faults. And you can see this if you look in the detail in, in the topography. And so that's what we, uh, we then found. And then after I delivered the report to them, and they said, oh, that's very interesting. Well, you know, so what kind of thing. Um, this earthquake happened, the Machazi earthquake just off to the north, and there's the, the actual fort scarp produced in the evening one night, about two or three meters of uh, locally. Here it's about two meters of. This person over here is, is a friend from London, Julian Bomber, who uh, is an earthquake engineer, actually, who um, uh, wrote the paper on this, and he specializes in seismic hazards. So that's what was suddenly observed. Um, um, late one night, near midnight, in, uh, um, in that area, along quite a considerable scarp length of about uh, 50 kilometers. Um, and uh, that is up here. So we had been looking at this digital elevation model and had detected that there were, this is very subtle topography, so the total relief here from sea level is up to about 190 meters in this region over here. You go to that, it's effectively, it's a coastal plain. But it's got these very distinct rift, uh, it's got a graven uh, ridge type structure to it. Um, and, so, and then when we did the analysis and we were, we were detecting the surface breaking faults, each of these yellow lines is an actual identifiable mappable fault in the topography from the high resolution or reasonably high resolution uh, digital elevation model. This is the gas pipeline, and that was the contentious area where the, uh, the gas pipeline was uh, constructed across the, uh, the fault system. So we've looked at that. This is the, uh, some of the details here. You can see the different grabens that have been identified, their names. I just uh, will look in more detail at this one over there, the Moabsa. And so this is what you see here. We go from about 150 meters over here in the, in the white to about 95 meters in there. So extremely subtle topography, but you can see these scops, you can see these little sag basins uh, over there. Uh, and and uh, this is the, the fault on the other side, the, what is called the Magazane fault. We also were able to look at uh, the, the slope aspect. So we, we, we uh, discriminated the slope by a sort of grayscale, and you can see the steeper scops along uh, the village of Rangani is just near the, the, the base, uh, SAG basin there, a little bit off the pipeline. Magazane is another village about here. This is a town called Moabza. Uh, I decided to name the, the, the towns, uh, the, the forts after the nearest village because at least it draws to the attention of the authorities that these are seismically hazardous areas and uh, um, things need to be t taken into consideration. So we, we had a proposal, and, and all of this was redone after the 2006 magnitude 7 earthquake up there. Back in the 1940s, a magnitude 6 and a half earthquake occurred somewhere here. We don't exactly know where. It could have been about here, but it could have been on one of these structures there. We, uh, it's too poorly located. So, and the, the point about setting up a seismographic and a geodetic monitoring system on the pipeline was postulated, but as far as I know, nothing has been done since 2007. So, that's the story. This is the, the overall pattern again. This is what I call the CH2007 model. And the interesting thing about the area that I've just been talking about is that it seems almost to replicate the same kind of pattern that you see on the larger scale, Victoria, Ravuma, with, uh, things on either side. You, you get these 
rift carbons with these intervening blocks between in pretty much a similar pattern at vastly different scales. Here are thousands of kilometers, here are just a few hundred kilometers. So um, there's a kind of similar, I call it um, self-similar pattern to the tectonics there. And, uh, and then again, coming back finally to the, the dynamic analogy, and this is what I pointed out before, the driving forces most likely here um, represent the poles of rotation are down here. So this is kind of reverse tongs approach. It looks almost as if you, got, you have sinking slabs off the African plate over here. You have a collision zone in this way. So there are probably subduction forces, and particularly on the Aegean area over here, there's probably a mantle push on the, on the Nubian plate in that area which is forcing it westward relative to the Eurasian and the Arabian blocks. Uh, and in that sense, if these are in some way connected across the Gulf of Aden down to the Madagascar region, that would be the, the pulling apart of Africa and the propagation of the rift down over here to the edge of the old oceanic crust here. And this is where things start to get squashed together and Luanli is having to, in part, move southwards and in part converge on Nubia in that area. So that's, that's our current analogy is that there is, uh, also the other thing is that there is uplift over here. You, can, you may have noticed the, the coloring on the topographic maps in this area. So there is what we call a, a Victoria swell push that's a big uplifted part of Africa, quite high. Uh, and that, that has a gravitational push force on the, on the crust on, and the lithosphere on either side of it. So combined with a, a push from Central Africa there, there's also a kind of pulling force up in the north, which then is giving rise to the attempt to propagate this down towards the Southwest Indian Ridge over here. That's basically how we look at the dynamics. So, and I think these are the main I think features the, the other, so we, we now know that it's, it's split between at least five plates, two of which are major, three minor. Uh, we've been able to reconcile over the years the ocean data from the mid-ocean ridges with the, what we call the instantaneous GPS data. And that can amount to the last 20 to 30 years, depending on how long the instruments have been going. Uh, and we now know that there is this oceanic the Wandley plate to the south of us. It may have edges in Madagascar and South Africa, but we, they, they, these are still controversial points which are being debated. And there, there was another plate that I postulated, you may have seen in that diagram, the tra so-called Transgari plate. It's a stress province, but the evidence from GPS now is that it does not exist as a separate plate structure. So that's where we are. Thank you. Again, just on one hour, sorry. I hope the uh, attention span wasn't too strained by that. <laughs> Are there any questions? I'm, I'm quite happy to stay on or answer them 